Welcome. This is the First Amendment, historically speaking, and my name is Frederick Douglass Dixon, and I will be your host. This is my inaugural show here at Urbana Public Television, and I would like to thank the entire staff for allowing me to come on air and forward the idea of esoteric information. Again, the name of the show is the First Amendment, historically speaking. This is the second generation of historically speaking and the First Amendment. The very first generation started about 30 years ago in the city of Chicago under the tutelage and the producing of my father, the Honorable Professor Willie Dixon, Jr., who is now 82 years young and still teaching at Kankakee Community College. So I wanted to say hello to him, number one. And again, I wanted to thank the staff here for allowing us to come across and speak to you for this brief time that we have. Urbana Public TV has indeed been a lightning bolt in the idea of forwarding public TV. So for that particular opportunity, we want to thank them greatly. Now today, uh, the very inaugural show, we wanted to speak about a coin term that will probably be very new to the most of you all. And the coin term in itself is called historiosis. Historiosis in itself is a concept that was developed, created, expanded, and forwarded by a visionary, Dr. Larry Ross, who created the Addiction Studies Program at Kennedy King College in Chicago, more specifically the Inglewood area that you hear so much about. So Dr. Ross's vision is amongst us. I have been charged with keeping his vision alive since he left us approximately July of 2011. And for that duty, I'm honored, humbled, and well-versed to continue his particular mission. Now, as we go with the coin term historiosis, I want to make sure that we have a functional definition of what this particular term means. This term has been driven from the idea of post-traumatic slave disorder. The idea of post-traumatic slave disorder has a sociological and psychological connection to those of us who were here and those of us who were slaves during the transatlantic slave trade. So when we talk about the sla transatlantic slave trade, we're talking about the dates of 1619 to 1865. Those are the coined dates for the transatlantic slave trade. So using a historical as well as a chronological timeline to forward the information, we find that those of us who were born after 1865 could not have post-traumatic slave order because we were never born as slaves. 1865 is the date that we'll use for our chronological ending of those of us who would possess post-traumatic slave disorder. Very simply put, one who did not fight in the war cannot have post-traumatic war syndrome. So in that vein, we look at post-traumatic slave order and we say those of us who are now continuing to live, and those of us who were the actual scions, sons and daughters of those captured from Africa, those brought here to the wilderness of North America on the slave ships, in the holes of slave ships, cannot only forget, never forget about this particular instance, but when we go to the transatlantic slave trade, we know for a fact, historically speaking, that those of us who came from Africa didn't come here on the Nina, Penta or the Santa Maria. No, we came here in the holes of slave ships. Those who are very familiar with the Amistad, those who are very familiar with the very popular slave ships named Hope, Integrity, Destiny, John the Baptist, and perhaps the most famous slave ship of all time, the good ship Jesus. So we find ourselves on a chronological timeline for those of us who and we go back to the coined term, historiosis. There's a compound term, historiosis. We want to take the last part, the osis, and connect it with the first part, history. The historiosis of what we have in America, those of us who were scions of the transatlantic slave trade, is we do have an osis, a sickness from the time that we have spent in the wilderness of North America under the idea of what the transatlantic slaves left for vestiges. So I want to begin by going to a functional definition of an osis. An osis, as far as Mr. Webster's dictionary, his ninth collegiate dictionary explains, is an action, a process, a sickness, a formation, an abnormal condition 
or an unhealthy situation that needs rectification. This indeed will advance the idea of post-traumatic slave disorder, which goes to the idea of our capacity, our mental capacity here as blacks in the wilderness of North America to have survived such a traumatic event. And that particular event, how the vestiges have multiplied, festered, and now become what we know as everyday vestiges in what we know today as the black psychosis. So I want to continue, and as we go, we have to go to a very important part of our mindset. Those of us who were born slaves still have an osis, a sickness that needs to be remedied. So that is the case today, and we will discuss hysteriosis, and we will concern ourselves today in this small time that we have with two very distinctive but yet overlooked terms that are sometimes lumped together for convenience, expediency, also for those who have very much so benefited from the idea of the transatlantic slave trade. So we want to look at two very different terms, but they're very close together when we say them. So I'll go very slowly so that all of us can understand. We will study today the difference between the study of blacks and black studies. The study of blacks and black studies. The study of blacks in itself, you all, is a coined and formatted way of forwarding information through what we call the public education, the idea of public education. And if we look to how the public here in America alone, just America, has been educated, and we talk about the masses of folks who have been educated, we mean to explain that it is taken directly from Plato's Republic. Now, for those of us who have not been familiar with Plato's Republic and the idea of what Plato means in this particular instance, then we have to get straight to that and square that away as well. So when we begin to talk about Plato's influence and Plato's thoughts about who should be educated and for what reasons, we have to realize that Plato himself spent 13 years at the feet of Egyptian professors learning about antiquity. And it comes to pass that it is well known, very well known, that Plato himself, during this 13 years as a student of antiquity, he found it far more interesting to study political science and philosophy than he did math or science. So we have to understand as we continue to look at the idea of public education and Plato's Republic and its importance. Now, when we begin to talk about black studies and the study of blacks. The study of blacks in itself is what we know today as our current curriculum. Now these two paradigms have di diametrically opposed views. So today we'll talk about them both. But the study of blacks will in itself be what we know as our former educational setting, K through 12, K through 20, and ongoing for those graduates and those PhDs and everything that we know that has tied directly into education here in America. Now, black studies in itself would be diametrically opposed. Black studies would in indeed forward esoteric information and uncover historical credence and give thought to things that have been swept under the rug, things that have been looked to as not scientific. So when we begin to talk about science, and science in itself comes from the root word seal, which means to know. We want to be very scientific here with this particular time that we have. So when we say science, and it comes from the root word seal, science in itself means to know. That means you have tested, retested research, and you come up with the exact same answer. So when we begin to talk about science, there's 196,940,000 square miles on this planet Earth. The circumference, 24,896 miles. The diameter, 7,926 miles. 93 million miles from the sun to the earth rotates 1,037 and one-third degrees per hour. That's scientific. That has been tested. And we come up with the exact same answer. So when we talk about the study of blacks, we talk about what we know today is our current curriculum. So when we begin to talk about our current curriculum, and if we can be more specific, when we talk about history and the idea of what has been recorded, I think Dr. Carter G. Woodson said it very well. Now, Dr. Carter G. Woodson is the second black man to graduate from Harvard University. Dr. Carter G. Woodson, and the very first, excuse me, is Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois. 
But Dr. Carter G. Woodson said it, and he said it well. He said, seldom that which we are merely taught nourishes the mind like that which we teach ourselves. So his words reverberate and they expand when we understand the difference between black studies and the study of blacks. So the study of blacks will have us look to the founding fathers of our country, of this great country, and the document that they produced to make sure that this country would be different from the throne and release them from the throne of England. And then we look directly to the founding fathers. Now, history would have us look to these founding fathers as great men, and that I do not have a argument with. Yes, these were very much so visionaries. But the question was, what was the vision? The question was, how would this vision be incorporated? And to be one who looks to this particular segment of history, I like to look to the idea of what the founding fathers were and what it is that they thought that was important. So when we begin to understand the idea of the founding fathers, we realize that 21 or so men, but 14 of those men were slave owners and the other seven profited greatly from the transatlantic slave trade. So as a general statement, when we ask, were the founding fathers very much so visionaries? Yes, and the question is the vision was to start a country, to remove them from the king and the queen's throne and power. So they wanted to be removed from their position as so-called slaves to the king of the queen of the throne, and they continue to create a situation where they use slaves to perhaps promote this country to be 500 years ahead of where it would be without the idea of slave labor. So before we go into the idea of slave labor, we have to understand that power itself is tied directly into land and land ownership. So we go no further than what we call the indigenous group here in America to have the land removed from their ownership and then have this land cultivated and worked for free, putting America and the founding fathers vision 500 or so years ahead of where any country would be if they had not had free land and free labor. So when we understand the founding fathers, we think about those who have created a democracy, or is it a republic? So when we begin to talk about the idea of history, and we talk about one who we know to be looked to as a person who of great acumen, uh, a great scholar, a great reader, a great writer, we look no further than the third president of the United States, President Thomas Jefferson. President Thomas Jefferson was indeed one who had vision. He was indeed one who had the idea of separation from the slavery that they accumulated from the king and the queen of the throne. So when we talk about Thomas Jefferson, we talk about the things that he left behind. And the idea of the study of blacks would have one look to Thomas Jefferson in the light of a hero, which indeed to some folks he are, and he is. And, and we won't wrestle or we won't challenge the idea of the greatness of Thomas Jefferson, but with the idea of black studies, we will begin to look at and research him in a different light. So when we talk about black studies, we're talking about researching our researcher and what they researched. So when we talk about Thomas Jefferson and we begin to understand that Thomas Jefferson was indeed the architect of the Declaration of Independence, the idea of Thomas Jefferson and his very well known piece of writing, the notes on the state of Virginia, he began to expound in so many different ways about the vision that he had for America, starting right in Virginia, the third president of the United States. But what's little known, and there we are with black studies, the esoteric information, what's very little known, what's very little taught, but is well known, is the idea of a young lady named Sally Hemming. Sally Hemming was indeed Thomas Jefferson's slave. She was indeed the half-sister of his wife, Martha. So Thomas Jefferson in himself, when we use an example of what really the difference between black studies and study of blacks is, he's an excellent example because we can talk about perhaps one of the most famous 
lines, in anything written about American independence, all men are created equal. Very strong term. All men are created equal. What we mean by that is this was the actual document. This was the actual line. This was the actual time, place, place and presence that removed, in this particular term, removed the power from the king and the queen, saying that when you are born, you will not automatically be the king. You'll have to work for it. So he said, all men are created equal. When we begin to understand the idea of what Thomas Jefferson and that particular group mean, and then we look to Thomas Jefferson's private life. We look to the relationship that he had in 17, when he began to create, well, when he was the actual ambassador to France living in Paris. As he leaves America, he's with two people. He's with his daughter and a 13-year-old slave, Sally Hemming. Sally Hemming indeed had a close to 40-year torrid affair, which some would consider to be a love affair. And in some regards, you may have excellent opportunity to use that term. Well, property, the pursuit of happiness was replaced in those certain lines with the pursuit of personal property. So indeed, this slave was personal property, but this slave had at least five children. This slave was never, ever freed. One of the sons, Madison, was freed, and he takes the name of another president. So this particular thought, when we talk about Thomas Jefferson as one person in history, we can use the idea and separate black studies and the study of blacks. When we go back to the study of blacks, we will look to the idea of the slave trade, and some folks have written and some historians have written that the idea of the slave trade, the transatlantic slave trade, it made black folks from Africa and those individuals more humanized. It made them Christians. It made them Americans. But the study of blacks would have you look to the transatlantic slave trade as a part of America's history that was not so brutal. On the other hand, the study of blacks will have you look to a slave auction for what it really was. It will also have you look to the removal of family members from what we call intact families, if you can have an intact family, or just to what we call the Middle Passage, where it took you approximately 100, between 90 and 120 days to make it from shore to shore, where you had so many folks on what we call slave ships. And we look to that and we talk about the Middle Passage and the greatest migration of any group, well, forced migration of any group, because right now till this day, black people here in America that we know to be black people in America are the only immigrants who did not ask to come to America. So as we look and separate the two, black studies would have us look to the idea of now, as we begin to talk about a post-racial society, and I would say that we've perhaps made a lot of progress towards that goal, if that is the goal, to have a post-racial society. But I looked at it in more than one way. Now, of course, I would be far more sensitive to any of the tremors of the Richter scales that have been overwhelming towards the idea towards hysteriosis, towards the sickness that we still have here in the wilderness of North America. So of course, this particular portion of what I will for forward to you will be that of the thought of a scion or a family member of an ex-slave living here in America today, years and years later, and speaking of a post-racial society. And when we talk about a post-racial society, we do indeed have a, a checkpoint. We do indeed have an idea of avenue of progress when we say that we have a black president. It is indeed a milestone to be looked at, but the study of blacks and black study is we look with a more critical eye. The study of blacks would say for itself, well, this is an excellent, excellent piece of history. And black studies would say he is the most disrespected president in the history of any president. 
Black studies would in turn say the 44th president has done, um, has been involved in, and we could call him a war president. He has been involved in wars since the very beginning of his first term. Black studies would look at it and say that he himself adopted these wars from uh, President 43, who was himself a war president. So when we look at the two and we separate them, and what we want to do when we separate them, we want to be very clear. We want to be clear about the idea of what's important when we separate the two. We're looking at two diametrically opposed paradigms. As we look at, more specifically, the history of America, and we look to Reconstruction directly after the transatlantic slave trade, we have to look to someone who was a very, very important figure during this particular time. And we go no further than Abraham Lincoln, our 16th president, who was indeed one who used his presidential powers to create a change. January 1st, 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation can never be denied. But Lincoln's words reverberate, and Lincoln's attitude about what was important. And Lincoln says, if I could win the war without freeing one slave, I would. So now during black studies and the study of blacks becomes a paradigm of the difference between someone who is anti-slavery and a person who is an abolitionist. And the question comes up again and again. Was our 16th president an abolitionist or was he one who was against slavery? Now, black studies would look at that very intensely. The study of blacks would call Abraham Lincoln an abolitionist to the highest heights, while black studies would look at it very critically and look at the idea of his wife, Martha, by proxy, owning about 300 slaves at the death of her father. So when we separate these two and we look at Abraham Lincoln and his genius, Abraham Lincoln expound time and time again the idea of freeing the slave was for the idea of winning the war. The idea of him forwarding information when we can quote him, and I'll paraphrase, but we can paraphrase him saying he was always in the position of superiority for the white man. These are common thoughts during that time, but the study of blacks will never forward that thought about Abraham Lincoln, nor will it talk about his relationship with Joshua Speed. Now, some of these things need to be researched so that you can research your researcher and find out what it is that I researched to get to these particular conclusions. So when we understand the seriousness of our history, and then we understand where we fall in the history, and then we use the idea of histriosis. Histriosis looms large, you all. So we want to look at histriosis and look at what goes on now today. And we look directly to the behavior of some of the things that we've seen. I don't think anything has been more clear recently than what has gone on in Ferguson, Missouri. That in is, is indeed separating the country. Most folks choose a side. There are not many of us who are neutral about the thought of Ferguson. If we go back slightly in our history, there were not many people who were, and we're talking about separated groups, there were not many people who did not have an opinion about O.J. Simpson's trial. These particular thoughts have continued to be the topics of much discussion with humorless fervor, much discussion with the thought of what it is that our nation has been and where our nation is going. Now, hysteriosis is indeed very much so important and should be used as one means to what we say democratize education, should be used as one means to scientific evolution, to be used as the idea of creating heroes for people who 
need to see heroes who look just like them. So for a young man who is aspiring to be a president, a young black man, and he sees Obama, yes, he has the idea of what this person looks like. There's a very wise judge. He's no longer with us now. And that's the famous judge, uh, Eugene R. Pincham. And he says, you can never be what you can never see. Historiosis in itself will separate the two. It will forward esoteric information. It will indeed put us in a strength where we will be able to be critical about what is being taught. There is a book that has become very famous. It's called The Lies My History Teachers Told. A very good book. None more so concerned about the idea of how history has been forwarded. That's what historiosis will tear apart. Historiosis will remove the veneer of hypocrisy that has gone on for years. It will also place into light some things that we have overlooked, or it will challenge historical docu dictums and documents for their veracity. So historiosis is very much so a part of what we call the future of black studies. It would also be a part of the fabric of American history, if taken scientifically, if taken appropriately, and it will indeed provide avenues that can start conversations that will lead to critical conferences, that will lead to the idea of future generations being a bit more attuned to what it is that has been the study of blacks versus black studies. Now, when we talk about black studies, yes, indeed, we do have heroes. And those are the heroes that have been forwarded to us, study of blacks, by what we call the white architects of black education. That movement has been around since the ending of slavery. So the white architects of black education will be studied under historiosis, under the idea of black studies, but never studied under the idea of the study of blacks. White architects of black education will never, ever rear his head, but will still control, indeed. So I look to historiosis as an avenue of achievement. I look to historiosis as continued research. And a very wise man, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, said it well. Being without knowledge, we disgrace ourselves, subject ourselves to suffering and shame. There has been a lot of words that have been used when we connect, when we see the behavior of black-on-black -black crime. Well, I want to be very clear. The actions, the attitudes, and the behaviors of any group only reflect the paradigms and the mindset that that group has. So when we think about the idea of what we know to be, as a teaching situation, one who is very wise will look to the teacher and not the student. So for us to be critical about our situation, we have to look to those who forwarded the information and why those actions, those attitudes and behaviors have come to be where they are and what role that the media plays along with propaganda. I really appreciate you all taking this very small time to take a critical ear to one particular thought, histriosis. Now, I have to say, I thank you all. And I'd like to say, this information may in no means change your mind. But because truth and you are so very important to me, I just thought you ought to know. I remain with esteem and respect a distinguished man of color, Frederick Douglass Dixon. Thank you.